Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're taking a look at the Obsession 15-inch UC. This is their new line of ultra-compact Dobsonian telescopes from Obsession. So first of all, what is it? Well, it's an astronomical telescope designed for looking up at the night sky. A primary mirror in the back, pretty big one here, 15 inches, gathers light and sends it into this secondary mirror out here, which deflects the light into the eyepiece. This is where you look. To change magnifications, you change eyepieces. So the mount is what they call a Dobsonian mount. It's a fancy name that simply means it goes up and down and left and right. It is named after West Coast astronomer John Dobson, who advocated and popularized its use several decades ago. So this model here is a 15-inch F4 optic, and it lists for $59.95 US dollars. It's a little bit deceptive because by the time you pay for the things that you need to get, the upgrades and any accessories that you might want, the shroud, for example, is $189. I pretty much view that as a necessity. The shipping was about 650 US dollars at the time of filming right now. By the time you get a fairly basic model like this, you are spending over $7,000 US. If you really want to get fancy and put an Argo Navis electronic system on it, you have to add another $3,500. So it's pretty easy to drop 10K or more on a telescope like this. If you have the money and you have the desire to get that, by all means, go for it. Tell your significant other, I said it was okay. Okay, so when I first saw this thing, I've been playing with Obsessions for 20 to 25 years, what is now known as the Classic Series. I was taken aback when I saw this for two reasons. First of all, it's sort of space-age, high-tech looking design. This doesn't look like any other telescope I've ever seen before. Could this be the shape of things to come? I don't know. The second thing is just how small and short this thing is. This is incredibly compact for a 15-inch telescope, and it's not just that, it's f4. This has been a complete ground-up rethinking of what a Dobsonian telescope is or should be by Dave Kriege. And I'll tell you, having played with this thing for a few nights now, I don't think this design was arrived at by chance. I think this is a, feels like a very lived-in design. Everything is there for a reason. I've only read through about half the manual, but I can tell you every once in a while I'll be playing with something and I'll realize, oh, okay, that's why that bolt is there. So be aware when you order one of these things, the mirror and the structure will probably arrive separately. Obsession doesn't make the mirrors, they subcontract those out to specialty mirror manufacturers. In this case, the owner got lucky, the mirror and the structure showed up within the same week. Ordering can take anywhere from six months to a year for delivery. Check Obsession for details at the time that you place an order. So if you're interested in the mirror itself, there are all sorts of documentation that comes with it. I do have those scanned and I will link those below if you want to take a look at those. You can geek out to your heart's delight. So again, this telescope does operate at f4. It is very fast, so you do need the paracore. I'll pull the eyepiece out like this. And the paracore is made by Teleview. And it looks like this. There have been a couple of different versions of this. This is almost $500 by itself. So if you don't have one of these, you need to figure that into your budget also. There are some things in common with normal truss tube Dobsonians. You have a mirror box of sorts at the bottom on a rocker box. You have an upper truss assembly, although it's more of a metal ring here with stuff attached to it. And in between, you have the truss poles. If you think about it, a telescope is mostly air. The whole purpose of the structure is just to hold the optics in place so that you can look through it. But other than that, a lot of this stuff has changed. For example, gone are the traditional upper truss assembly. Gone is the traditional you know, wooden box. A lot of the wooden parts that you see in many Dobsonians have been replaced by metal. So I can't think of any better way to show you the differences than by just go ahead and taking this apart and assembling it for you. Let's go ahead and do that. So this is a wide angle shot showing you all of the parts on the ground. This is the whole telescope. That's everything. Dave Kriege designed this thing so that it could be fit into the hatchback of a car. I think you could succeed it here. You could probably get two of them in a small SUV. Anyway, let's put this thing together and I'll point out what's different about this versus the classic series Dobbs that you may be used to. Okay, so let's start with the baseboard here. So this is what it rides on and it's pretty small. It's only about 12 pounds and I measured this at about 16 by 18 inches in a rectangle. To show you how small that is, the base of my 8-inch Orion X-T8 Dobsonian 
is about this size and diameter, and that's an 8 inch. This is a 15. Okay, so the next thing goes on is this mirror assembly here, and I hesitate to call this a rocker box because he's done away with, you know, most of what a traditional rocker box does. He calls this a VMB, a virtual mirror box. We're going to have to come up with some new terms here. This is by far the most weighty of the devices. This is about 54 pounds, and you lift it on to here. So you notice I had a towel on the floor here. There's a reason for that. With no mirror box or rocker box around it to speak of in the traditional sense, the lowest point of contact is the bearings. So when you set it down, the bearings are the things that are going to touch the ground. Be sure to be careful with that and set it on something if possible, a blanket, a towel, a comforter, something like that. Just have it in the car with you. So if you look at the back of the mirror box, this is the most conventional and conservative looking part of the entire telescope. In fact, if you were just looking at the back, you might convince yourself that this is one of the classic series of obsession telescopes. The mirror cell is a very familiar sight. The only difference here is that the all-important personalized nameplate is back there without a traditional rocker box around it. That's the only place they could find to put it. Okay, so now we come to the truss poles. Now, in a traditional Dobsonian truss pole assembly, there are either four or eight truss poles going around the rocker box. Usually there are eight, but if there are four, like in a Star Master, they just double up on them. There's just two per assembly, so you only have to deal with four items. This one is different. So it doesn't have four or eight truss poles. It has six. And not only that, all six of them are in this assembly. It's just one piece like this. So there's only one assembly here to deal with. And not only that, instead of the truss poles all being the same length, one of them, one set of them here is shorter than the other, and it goes on the front here. So that eliminates any sort of confusion or debate as to does the same truss pole have to go in the same slot every time for collimation? No, it's just all like this every time. Also, with only three points of contact on the mirror box and on the upper truss assembly, all other things being equal as opposed to putting four or eight contact points on, assembly should go slightly faster. So I'll go ahead and uh, put these on. We'll be back in just a minute. And we're back. It's about two and a half minutes later. Not too bad putting these on. A couple of quick notes. First of all, the mirror cover is left on until the last possible moment. That's one of the last things you do. You don't want things falling on the mirror. The second thing is all of the hardware is captive so you don't have to worry about losing anything. So we've got this thing on, and this is probably the trickiest part of the whole assembly. It's not too bad. The problem is these things have a tendency to wander around on you as you put the upper truss on. But you can mitigate that. You can wrap something around it, or you could, in fact, put the shroud on at this point. This is what I usually do. I'm going to leave it off because I want you to see everything that's on the assembly here. So this is the upper truss. And again, it's not a traditional upper truss that you're used to seeing. This is more just a ring of metal that's got some stuff bolted onto it, and it's got some uh, things that are bolted on, but as needed. So there's a light shroud behind the secondary mirror here to prevent light from getting in. There is a stock that holds the Telrad, and another one that holds this feather touch focuser. Very beautiful indeed. If you get the finder, it gives you a little welded bracket right here. So in keeping with the themes of threes here, there's a three stock secondary. It comes permanently collimated from the factory so that if you are going to collimate the secondary mirror, you don't have to worry about that first step, you know, centering the secondary inside the ring. That's already done for you. Okay, so let's go ahead and put this on. This looks heavier than it is. This whole assembly only weighs about six and a half pounds, and there's a convenient handle here that will let you hold it just long enough to position these three uh, truss poles in place here. So you can mount the focuser in any of the three positions. I'm going to go ahead and right justify this for a right-handed person just because this is the way most of you are going to see it. So I'll go ahead and put these on. Okay, so now that we have the upper truss on, we can finish tightening these bolts. I did that in the break and it's ready to go. So you can take the paracore, put it in the focuser like so, get an eyepiece. This is a 27 millimeter panoptic in here and you're ready to observe. Okay, so I did want to show you the shroud here. This opens up, there's sort of a flexible ring at the bottom here. This goes towards the ground side of the scope, and towards the top, of course, you have the Obsession logo. 
I did want to draw your attention to one thing here. There appears to be a rip in the fabric. That is supposed to be there. This hole is sewn and reinforced. And it's there in case you have the Argo Navis electronic system. You need to pass things through that hole. So I want to draw your attention to one more minor quirk. Just before securing the bands to the bolts here and getting the shroud down, the, you'll notice the actual shroud doesn't go all the way down. There's a little bit of a gap here. And you can use it this way. I did it myself. But to cover that final few inches, he has this sort of plastic shroud here. And what you do, it secures via Velcro on both sides here. And then you pull this down. And then these go on like this. And there you have it, the assembled telescope. And here we are in the driveway with the Obsession 15-inch UC telescope. Had it out several nights now, and I'll tell you, I've had a great deal of fun with it. And again, this handle here is very useful. The eyepiece I used most often was my 27mm panoptic, although I did use this as an excuse to break out my Teleview 26mm Type 5 Nagler. That falls under the category of the eyepiece that I most regret that they discontinued. I wish they would bring that thing back. So people ask me about the dew here. The uh, secondary is just sort of exposed out here. I put a 9-volt battery on here and Velcroed it. I didn't have any problems. Uh, it's June now as I'm filming this. It is somewhat humid out. I do suspect if I do continue to use this that I will have a problem. But so far, no issues with dew either here or on the focuser. Also, you'll notice I have this thing on a rolling dolly. This helps me move the thing around. I built that myself. You can make one too. My woodworking skills, are, I think, are modest at best, but you just get a square piece of wood, some casters, and you can roll the thing assembled in and out of the garage. You don't have to take the thing apart. You are going to lose a little bit of stability with that thing, even if you use the casters that lock. And it also is going to raise the telescope a few inches off the ground. But in either case, you know, I think the convenience of having the dolly is worth it. Okay, so what can you see with a 15-inch telescope? Well, with this class of telescope, you're getting to the point where just about anything you're going to see in a star atlas is going to be within reach. The big question is going to be your seeing conditions and your personal ability to see, your skill level. I had so much fun with this thing. You know, a lot of times when I review a telescope I really like, I just stop taking notes. I just sit there and enjoy the thing. And that's what happened here. So I went and looked at, you know, just the showpiece objects. The M81, M82 area in Ursa Major gets very busy. M106, M97, and M108. M97, that Owl Nebula, is tough from around here. We have a lot of light pollution towards the north. No problem with this guy. I even kind of saw the eyes at higher power. The NGC 3190 group setting in the west, no problem getting two or three of those. Globular clusters are wonderful. In fact, M92, that's the smaller of the famous globulars in Hercules, looks kind of the way M13 does in an 8-inch telescope. And M13, of course, is just huge. There's a small galaxy next to M13 called NGC 6207. It's not a particularly difficult object. You can see that with a six or eight inch, but it's a little bit tough. You've got to kind of move it around and get some averted vision going here. No problem, direct vision. So there you have it, a review of the 15 inch UC Ultra Compact Series Dobsonian from Obsession. This is their new line. I hope this has given you some information to decide whether this is right for you or not. If you have one of these, let us know in the comments below what you've done with it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.